Hey there, Rednecks, Preppies, Redneck Preppies. It's me, the Redneck Preppy. How you doing today? Great? Good. This is truly a first for the channel, a short and convoluted history episode. Not about a firearm, but a firearm designer. Today we're going to take a brief look at Melvin Johnson, a sometimes overlooked firearms designer when compared to titans like John Moses Browning, John Garand, or Hiram Maxim. As with every episode in the short and convoluted series, this is meant as an introduction, not an exhaustive investigation. Melvin Maynard Johnson Jr. was born on August the 6th, 1909 in Boston, Massachusetts, to a family that has been described as affluent. His father was an author and university professor, so perhaps not surprising that the young Johnson was extremely intelligent and with a number of interests, including firearms and how they were designed. Johnson even wrote several technical articles on firearms for magazines during the 1930s. Johnson attended Noble and Greenoff School in Dedham, just across the Charles River from Boston, before entering Harvard Law School. While a student there, in March 1933, Johnson was commissioned into the Marine Corps Reserve as a second lieutenant. Graduating from Harvard in 1934, he began to practice law in Boston until 1939, and on occasion, also teaching at the university. Johnson's interest in firearms design hadn't ended simply because he was now a lawyer. As an officer in the Marine Corps Reserve, he was assigned as an observer at the legendary Springfield Armory, then the federal government's primary small arms design, testing, and manufacturing center. His task was to report on the trials for the 276 Pedersen rifle and what would become the M1 Garand. Signaling early that he didn't particularly care for the Garand, Johnson designed his own rifle in 1935 that utilized a retarded blowback gas operating system and along the way picked up four patents related to it. A retarded blowback system is similar to a simple blowback system but sees a bolt that's never fully locked but rather seals the cartridge in the chamber via mechanical resistance of some kind. You can see that kind of system in rifles like the Heckler & Koch G3. Johnson wasn't merely all about the law and firearms design. Along the way, he also married American tennis star Virginia Rice. Together, they had three sons and one daughter. Although his prototype rifle didn't initially move the needle, Johnson proceeded to delve more into professional firearms design and, along with his father, set up Johnson Automatics Trust, later known as Johnson Automatics Incorporated. It was here that he designed both his semi-automatic rifle, the M1941 Johnson rifle, and the M1941 Johnson light machine gun. Incidentally, for your next firearms trivia night, Johnson nicknamed all of the firearms he designed, and the rifle was dubbed Betsy, while the LMG was Emma. Both were manufactured at Universal Windings Corporation in Cranston, Rhode Island. Although Johnson was a commissioned officer in the Marine Corps Reserve, he didn't see combat as the Corps felt that his skills in weapons design was too important to risk, so he was placed on the inactive status list during the Second World War. Now, if you watched my short and convoluted history of the M1 Garand video, you'll undoubtedly remember that he was no fan of that rifle, believing that it would suffer reliability issues due to its gas operating system and inconsistency of ammunition. To that end, he attempted to convince military brass in the early days of M1 Garand adoption that they needed to switch horses to his M1941 rifle. The truly remarkable thing is they actually did give it a trial, though it was limited in scope. Unfortunately for Johnson, however, their testing concluded that the M1 Garand was the superior rifle. Now, part of that may have had to do with the large amount of time and money they had already spent on designing, tooling up for, and actually producing the M1 Garand. 
and part of it may have been influenced by the immediate need for a rifle thanks to the storm clouds over Europe. Or they may have honestly felt that the Garand was simply better. That wasn't the end of the Johnson rifle, however. The Marine Corps did like the rifle, and his light machine gun for that matter, and issued them in limited numbers in the Pacific Theater. Some of those rifles had been part of an order placed by the Netherlands for issue in the Dutch East Indies, but the invasion there by the Japanese meant that most hadn't been delivered. The Marines did make several requests that the rifle be formally adopted, but the American military remained firmly behind the M1 Garand. That said, Johnson did actually manage to sell some of his rifles to the United States Army's 1st Special Service Force, an elite Canadian-American commando unit that saw action in Italy, France, and the Aleutian Islands. Also ordering rifles was Chile in 1943, and the rifle also saw action in China by nationalist forces, though there is some debate about that. The rifle was also carried by anti-Castro forces during the Bay of Pigs invasion, where a number were captured after those forces were defeated. Incidentally, there was another Johnson rifle, this one called the Auto Carbine. It was a bit of a mix between the rifle utilizing its rotary magazine and the LMG from which it took its form and 22-inch barrel. The Netherlands had ordered the full-size M1941 rifle for their East Indian soldiers, and Johnson, now a captain in the reserve, designed the auto carbine because he believed that those shorter soldiers might prefer a handier rifle. If I had an army, I would give some of the men light machine guns and the rest of them this carbine, Johnson told the Providence Journal in a story on the carbine. Our light machine gun weighs only 12 and a half pounds without the mounts and can be used as a rifle. With that machine gun and the carbine, you would have two light weapons with terrific firepower. Well, although the Dutch seemed supportive of the idea of an auto carbine, in the end they ordered none of them. Now, only five of the prototype carbines were made, and one of them ended up in the hands of Marine Corps paratrooper Harry Torgerson, a friend of Johnson and a fan of his rifles. He apparently loved the shorter profile of the auto carbine and managed to convince Johnson to give him one and bringing it with him to Bougainville in 1942. The Marine 1st Parachute Battalion apparently became interested in it to replace the rising submachine gun, though again, like the Dutch, not enough to actually place any orders. After World War II, the government, not surprisingly, stopped raining money on the weapons industry, so Johnson shifted his focus to the civilian market, which included converting surplus M1941 rifles and manufacturing custom high-end hunting rifles. He even produced a rubber band powered rifle in 1947 that shot small pellets that Life magazine glowingly covered in their June 30th, 1947 issue. In 1949, he was promoted to Colonel in the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps Reserve after transferring over from the Marine Corps Reserve. And in 1951, he was appointed as a consultant to Secretary of Defense Robert Lovett. This was notable because Lovett was a key proponent of rearming the United States after the drawdown due to the end of the Second World War and wanting to reorganize American defense policy. Not a bad ear for Johnson to have if he wanted to try and sell the government more guns. In the early 1950s, he managed to convince Winchester's head, John Olin, to buy out his company and hire Johnson as a consultant and designer. While at Winchester, he would have worked alongside David Carbine Williams, one of the chief designers of the M1 Carbine. We don't know if the pair actually worked together on any projects, but much of Johnson's future work may have been informed by that association. Among his many projects going forward, 
Johnson worked on improvements to the M1 carbine. The reason for this work was that some soldiers during World War II and the Korean War complained that the 30 carbine round was underpowered. That prompted Johnson to experiment with creating a small, high-velocity, and more lethal round, which saw him convert the rifle to fire his newly designed 5.7mm MMJ cartridge, also known as the 22 Spitfire. In December 1961, he created a new company called Johnson Guns Incorporated to sell this convertible rifle to the military. Unfortunately for Johnson, he learned the following February that the Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known to most as ARPA, showed little interest. At this point, he refocused and decided to try and sell the modified carbine to civilian and law enforcement agencies. Now, it's a little out of the purview of this video, but Johnson created a number of M1 carbine-based rifles for these markets, including the one named the Spitfire that was initially for law enforcement use, with a civilian model following shortly after. He eventually also designed a number of rifles that more closely resembled a traditional M1 carbine, though in sporter configurations, and also in the 5.7mm cartridge. A number of companies manufactured the carbines for Johnson guns, including the Plainfield Machine Company of New Jersey and Universal Firearms of Florida. Sales of his rifles were never particularly robust, probably due to having surplus M1 carbines as competition. Also, around the time that Johnson was pitching his 5.7mm powered rifle to ARPA, the Defense Department and Armalite were working on what would eventually become the M16 rifle, chambered in 556 by 45 that small, speedy caliber with increased lethality that Johnson was interested in. It should be noted that along with his own endeavors, Johnson did some consulting work with both Armalite and Colt on this project. Johnson died suddenly on January the 9th, 1965, of a heart attack at the young age of 55. He was buried at the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Taking over as head of his company was his son, Edward Johnson. The company, however, closed its doors in 1967 due to low sales to the civilian market and no military contracts. Contributing to the company's difficulties was that surplus 30 carbine for unmodified M1 carbines was plentiful, thereby fueling those sales, while there was some trouble in producing the 5.7mm cartridge. Today, his 22 Spitfire, or 5.7mm MMJ cartridge if you prefer, is difficult to find and rarely, if ever, produced due to the old issue of there being no real demand for it and no company willing to mass produce it without demand. If you own one of Johnson's rifles chambered in this caliber, you're obviously reloading. There has been a temptation by some to consider Johnson to be a lesser firearms designer than men like Garand, Browning, and Patterson, among others, mostly because of the failure of both the Johnson rifle and LMG to be adopted into formal American military service, and the dead end that the 5.7mm cartridge proved to be. I think that's hugely unfair. Johnson's sheer design genius was on display in the firearms that he designed, whether they were military or civilian arms. And his legacy continues on to this day. Although he certainly wasn't unique in this, he foresaw that small, higher velocity rounds were the future for the army. His patents involving bolt designs were later used in the creation of the AR-10, AR-15, and M-16 rifles by Armalite. None of Johnson's rifles ever saw wide military adoption, to be sure, but he was nonetheless regarded by his peers, then and now, as one of the finest minds in the field. Every soldier anywhere that's carried an M-16 or an M-4 benefited from his work, and should be pleased that part of that rifle came from the mind of Melvin 
Maynard Johnson Jr. At any rate, I hope you found today's video to be at least vaguely entertaining and mildly informative. As always, I hope you have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.